Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back and uh, we're happy to have uh, Matt Toynton from uh, Bristol. And um, he'll be speaking about perc uh, percolation or probability on uh, finite uh, groups, right? Uh, yeah, finite transitive graphs, yeah. And the transitive graphs, okay. Yeah. Uh, right, well, thanks. Thanks very much for the invitation. It's very, uh, I'm very happy to be able to speak to you all. Let me just change camera so that you can see what I'm writing. And I'm just going to better focus. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, can everybody, is there anyone who can't really read that? You can read it, but it's shimmering. Okay. 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 Uh, I'll try to, I'll try to write big and clearly. And if, if, if at any point people can't read, just feel free to shout out and I'll try to do something about it. Um, all right. Um, yeah, so uh, my original title was was probability on finite transitive graphs. I've um, narrowed the scope, as I was just saying, um, slightly, and I'm, it's, it's now going to be called percolation on finite transitive graphs. Just because I don't think I'll have time to talk about everything I originally wanted to talk about, but you'll still get a, a large number of the ideas I wanted to convey, I think, with this more specific title. Um, so I, I'll briefly introduce the notion of percolation. I, I imagine with this audience, it's reasonably well known, but let me just set things up anyway. Um, so basically, the rough idea in um, percolation is you start with some graph, um, classically a lattice type graph, but um, you start with some graph G, such as this um, infinite square lattice. Um, and then given a parameter P between zero and one, you define a random subgraph, which I'll call G sub P by um, each, you look at each edge independently and at random, you either delete or retain that edge. So by um, deleting or retaining each edge of G uh, independently, Um, at random, and you uh, delete or you retain with probability p, and then of course delete with probability one minus p. So this is this is Bernoulli bond percolation, one of the standard percolation models. So each each edge you look at separately. Uh, you toss a weighted coin. If it comes up heads, you keep the edge. If it comes up tails, um, you delete it. Um, and let's see. Um, uh, so if so, clear. So this you end up with a so GP. So if G has vertex set V and edge set E, then GP has the same vertex set but has some random edge set, okay? So trivially, if, um, if P, this parameter, this retention probability is zero, then of course, um, GP is just um, the vertex set with no edges at all. And if P equals one, then trivially, GP is just the original graph G. Um, and then the more interesting question is, what does this random subgraph GP look like for intermediate values between zero and one? Okay, and a, a particularly classical question concerns whether or not this GP has an infinite connected component or not. Okay, so I'm going to write um, psi of P to be the probability that GP has an infinite 
connected component. Um, <clears throat> so of course, if G the graph in the first place is infinite, then um, um, psi of one is of course one. If uh, if you retain every edge, then of course you have an infinite connected component. Um, it's zero if um, V is zero. And the question is what happens in between? Um, and a couple of classical facts. First is that um, um, first is that um, this probability is always either zero or one. So either you have zero probability of having an infinite component, or you have probability one of having an infinite component. Okay. And the second classical fact is that um, there exists what's called a critical probability, which I'll write PC of G, but I'll often drop the, drop the brackets G when it's clear from context, which it, which it normally will be, um, such that um, this psi of P, this probability of having an infinite component is zero um, whenever the parameter P is less than this critical probability and psi of p is one when p is bigger than this critical probability. Okay, so uh, um, there's what's called the subcritical phase where you have no infinite component and then at some critical value of p, all of a sudden the model jumps. There's what's called a phase transition and you have what's called the supercritical phase where you're guaranteed to have uh, um, an infinite component in this random graph. Um, so one, um, I guess, classical question is to um, try to compute this critical probability for whatever graph you're looking at. Um, and, um, it is known for a few graphs. So for example, this, this two-dimensional grid that I drew before, which I'm going to call um, Z squared, um, is known that the critical probability is a half. So PC of Z squared is a half. Um, that's due to Harris and Keston. Um, but in general, computing these critical probabilities for given graphs is not easy. Um, so in general, this is hard to do. So a slightly uh, kind of a, a, an easier version of the question, so an easier question is um, when is PC of G, so for which graphs G is PC strictly less than one. So when is there some, so when P is one trivially, um, the graph has an infinite, the random graph has an infinite connected components, for which starting graphs G is there some non-trivial phase transition, some, not, some value of P strictly less than one that still gives you an infinite component um, with probability one. Okay, and that's um, that question is the starting point for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so it's not hard to see, given this computation for PC of the square grid, it's not hard to answer this easier question um, for square grids of different dimension. So if you if you so I said, um, I'm going to write Z squared for this square grid. Um, Z 
it's just going to be a, an infinite line graph. So you can think of that as a one dimensional grid. Um, and Z cubed, I'll try to draw a little bit of it. Is a three dimensional grid and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and it's not too hard to see that PC of Z to the D is strictly less than one if and only if D is at least one. Okay. So the D equals one case. It's trivial. If you um, if you um, if you fix maybe the zero the zero vertex here and z, um, if the probability of deleting an edge is greater than one, so if p is strictly less than one, the probability of deleting an edge is greater than one. You delete infinitely many edges in each direction, so you trivially have uh, are left with no connected components. Um, once you know that p c of z squared is less than one. It's also then very easy to see that PC of Z to the D is strictly less than one for all D greater than two. Uh, and that's, for example, because um, high dimensional grids all have um, Z squared subgraphs. So you can look at this uh, two dimensional slice of Z cubed, for example. Okay, so Z cubed. Has a, has a z squared subgraph, and so if um, if p is greater than a half, then even that z squared subgraph has an infinite connected, connected component. So certainly the whole of z cubed does. And I, I and I'm spelling that out in um, in detail, even though it's rather trivial, because uh, that's an argument that's going to play an important role later. Although I'll have to refine it a little bit. Okay, but basically trivial. If you, you have this, yeah, this z squared subgraph. And so what we know about z squared is enough to tell us that PC is less than one for z cubed. Okay. Um, and fairly recently, um, I'm going to state a theorem without defining all the terms to start with, and then I'm going to gradually um, define the terms in a minute. Um, but um, a rather spectacular generalization of this was, was recently proven by a few authors. So Dominique Copin, uh, Swami, uh, Rafi, Severo, and Anario. Um, and I think 2018 was when it was on archive. I guess the publication date is more recent than that. Um, <clears throat> but they generalized this, um, this fact that um, PC of Z to the D is less than one, if and only if D is greater than one. They showed um, that um, if we let G be a, uh, an infinite transitive, Graph. And I'll tell you what that means in just a second, if you don't already know. Um, then um, PC of G is strictly less than one if and only if. Um, and I put something in inverted commas if and only if G is um, more than one dimensional. Or has dimension greater than one, and again, I'll I'll make that more precise and give you a proper definition in just a second. Um, but we saw that. So I said before that. Um, uh, oh yeah, here. The PC of Z to the D is less than one if and only if you're on dimension greater than one for these square grids. And what these authors shown is that for an arbitrary transitive graph, you still have PC less than one. If and only if the graph is somehow not one dimensional, more than one dimensional. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm now going to uh, define the various terms that will allow me to make that clearer and more precise. Before I do that, let me just say that they also, their result is more general than just transitive graphs. Okay, so they, 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 they prove something about arbitrary graphs that have um, what's called isoparametric dimension greater than four. Um, I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about isoparametric dimension, so I, I'm going to kind of suppress um, that more general aspect of their work. But I, I want to just, just at least to say out loud that they've done more than just this. But this is the bit of their work that I'm going to focus on. Okay. So first of all, let me tell you what a transitive graph is. So actually, I can tell you loosely speaking, a transitive graph is basically one in which all the vertices look the same. And I'm going to make that precise in just a second. But for example, z squared is a transitive graph. And the reason z squared is transitive is because when I haven't labeled it like this, um, you have no way of knowing where, which is the origin, which vertex is the origin. And more than that, I could tell you that any of these vertices with the origin and you, ah, someone saying I can skip the definition of transitivity. Okay, I'm happy to do that. No worries. Um, but not the dimension, I'm afraid. Not the dimension. No, that's fine. I'll, tell, I'll, I'll, I'll define that. That's fine. Thanks very much. It's useful to know, actually. Um, okay. So actually, I'm going to still use, so I'm going to define dimension in terms of um, what's called the growth rate of the graph. So we'll define dimension in terms of what's called the growth rate. So um, to define that, I have to um, just come back to this picture. Again. So if we, um, um, let's fix some vertex X of um, whatever graph we're looking at. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a notation um, <clears throat> B X comma R, so for R, natural number, and I write B of X comma R for the ball of radius R um, centered at the vertex X. So that's the set of all um, vertices V such that the distance from X to V is at most R. Okay, so um, in this case, um, uh, the ball of radius zero is just the vertex X itself, the ball of radius one, all these vertices that you can reach from X by crossing just one edge, the ball of radius two, is all the vertices inside this diamond shape, the ball of radius three, is all the vertices in here, and so on and so forth. Okay, fair enough. Um, and we're going to write, um, yeah, so a classical fact about transitive graphs is that if um, G is um, transitive, then there exists, then either the size of these balls um, grows faster than any polynomial. So the size of the ball of radius R divided by R to the D goes to infinity um, for all D. So either it grows faster than any polynomial or um, there exists a natural number D and constant C, uh, lowercase and uppercase, bigger than zero, such that. Um, Um, such that the size of the ball of radius r is bounded above and below by a constant times r to the d. Okay, so either the, the balls grow faster than any polynomial, or there's some polynomial of integer degree um, such that the balls grow at exactly that rate. Um, 
And okay, so that's that's true of an arbitrary transitive graph. And I'm going to define so for example, I'll just very briefly say that of course the balls in z squared grow quadratically in in um, in R, and more generally in z to the d, they grow like a polynomial of degree d. Um, and um, uh, we define the growth degree of G to be infinite in the former case if the balls grow faster than any polynomial. and equal to D in this latter case. Okay, so if the balls grow faster than any polynomial, we say the graph has growth degree infinity. And if the balls grow like a polynomial of degree D, then we define that D to be the growth degree of the graph. Um, and so um, more precisely, what, um, so I'm gonna treat this um, degree is what I, this growth degree is what I call um, the dimension of the graph, which coincides in the case of z to the d with, um, with the more familiar notion of dimension. And what these authors more precisely showed was that um, if um, g is transitive, then um, pc of g is strictly less than one, if and only if the growth degree of G is um, greater than one. All right. Any questions about any of that so far? It's all fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So what I want to do is give a very, very, very high level overview of the structure of this, um, uh, of this proof. And it's, it's, it's very high, it's very high level um, indeed. Um, but just to give you an idea of um, how we're going to approach a related problem I'm gonna talk about in a minute. A high level um, structure of the proof is firstly, um, they show that um, uh, PC is less than one if the growth degree of G is um, greater than four. All right, and somehow this this is this is basically the main bulk of their work. This is this is the hard bit, um, and this is this is this is the main thing they've that they've done. And I'm not going to say much at all about this. Um, so the next thing they do is they um, apply um, theorems of Gromov and Trofimov which say that if um, the growth degree of G is, um, well, equals some D, well, in particular, if it's, if it's at most four, let's say, um, then um, G is what's called roughly isometric, to uh, nilpotent Cayley graph. Okay, and I'll um, define, I don't know, I, do I need to define Cayley graph, do you think, or not? No, okay. Do I, how about nilpotent? Actually, I don't want to define nilpotent anyway. I just want to tell, I, I want to tell you enough properties about it to say why it's useful without going into detail. So that's great. Um, so if the growth degree is at most four, then G is roughly isometric to a nilpotent Cayley graph. Um, 
So I won't make precise what roughly isometric means, but let's just say that it's, it means you can approximate um, the graph by an opposite Kelly graph in a way that's good enough um, to exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, it, it preserves the property of, um, P, of, of having PC less than one. Um, and um, and I don't want to tell you what exactly what. Uh, so the question why Asaf is that directed to me and what's it what's it about? Why is it invariant? Um, honestly, I can't. No, no need to define. Oh, roughly isometric. Okay, yeah. No, I wasn't going to. Um, yeah. As for why it's why PC less than one is invariant, um, I honestly can't remember exactly what the proof is. I could probably reconstruct it, but I don't think it would be a good use of everyone's time. Um, but it's it's an but it's an easy it's an easy it's not it's not a difficult it's not a deep thing it's it's a it's a fairly but easy. Thing. I think basically long paths stay alive if you copy them by rough isometry they stay long right so their length may change so you kind of get you know big components kind of still survive so roughly that's the basic idea between these things. Yeah, that that sounds that sounds plausible. So I'm not so I'm not really an expert on. Um, probability or calculation um, uh, so I so some of this background I'm kind of I'm not the best person to give you intuition about why it's true but I but I do I, I know it's a standard fact and it's um, you're here for the graph theory basically yes yeah the graph yeah and the group theory exactly uh, <laughs> that's right Fair enough. Um, but uh, but yeah but I but I think it's a standard and not difficult fact is, is, is everyone happy if I just say that Happy, great. Yep, yep. Okay, nice. Um, <clears throat> uh, anyway, so the and I also don't want to tell you what a a, a nil percent. Um, um, oh yeah, that's true, Ariel. That's a good point. So it's so it's not so P, the value of PC may change, but the property of PC being strictly less than one um, doesn't doesn't change under rough isometry. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so and in particular, why this is useful is that nilpotent um, Kelly graph have um, with growth degree greater than one have Z squared subgraphs. Okay. So let's just recap what I've said. So they first show that if, um, if the growth degree is large enough, then PC is strictly less than one. Then using um, some classical work of Gromov and Trofimov, we know that if a, if a transitive graph has finite growth degree, then it can be, uh, then it's roughly isometric, can be approximated by a nilpotent Cayley graph. And then it's, um, yeah, nil, nilpotent Kelly graphs have have, um, have a lot of structure, which makes them easy to work with. And one property they have is that if the growth degree is greater than one, then they have a Z two subgraph. And then again, you apply the trivial argument I said before. You just you just if if um, if P is at least a half, then that Z two subgraph has an infinite component, so the whole thing does. Okay, so that is. Um, that's a very high level um, overview of, of how they um, uh, of how they get their result for infinite transitive graphs. Um, and then what um, Tom Hutchcroft and I have done in recent work is to uh, get an analogous result for finite transitive graphs. So again, I'm going to write this theorem very roughly. to start with, and then um, define the details and come back and tell you a bit more um, carefully what the statement is. Um, but um, 
Well, actually, maybe I'll maybe I'll define PC for finite graphs first. I think that's maybe a bit more useful. So, um, yeah. So I now want to look at percolation on finite graphs. Okay, so you can still do the same um, process on a finite graph. You start with the graph G, and then you independently random delete or retain any of the edges of G. Um, but of course, it no longer makes sense to ask whether or not G has an infinite component. Um, so instead, we ask um, <clears throat> if G is finite. Um, we define PC of G to be the infimum of all P such that um, uh, where you have where where the where you have uh, a connected component containing at least half the vertices with probability at least half. Um, so probability that GP contains a uh, component, a uh, connected component with at least half size of the vertices. Is at least a half. Okay, so when when p is less than this PC, you um, uh, you're unlikely to have um, a connected component containing at least half the vertices. And when PC is bigger than this PC, you are likely to have a component containing at least half of the vertices. And um, of course, the correct, correct me if I'm wrong, you basically could have taken instead of half the vertices, three quarters, and it wouldn't yeah. have mattered much for the argument. Yeah, literally, yeah. So literally what I'm about to say is this, these, these choices of half are completely arbitrary just, just for concreteness during the talk. So in fact, in the paper, we, we have various parameters and we define PC of G comma parameters, in, which, which indicate what properties we want here. Um, but I think it's also known, I believe, that if you, if you prove it for so as well as the argument being the same, I, I believe it's known that if you if you prove this for an arbitrary value, say a half, then I think you can you can you can deduce a similar statement for um, for other parameters as well. But you're right, the 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 halves here are completely arbitrary. All right, um, <clears throat> and. Um, And the theorem that Tom and I proved is that um, if G is a finite transitive graph, then um, uh, let's say that's not one dimensional. which I put in inverted commas, but in an appropriate sense, non one dimensional finite graph, um, then um, PC G is, so if I just wrote strictly less than one now, it wouldn't mean very much because obviously in a finite graph, if, if, um, if you make P large enough, um, then you can, you can make it as likely as you want for the, for the random, uh, for GP to be a complete graph, um, but but how large P has to be will depend on the number of vertices, number of edges. So the point is, we want it bounded away from one by some epsilon that doesn't depend on the size of the graph. Okay, so you ideally you want some absolute um, epsilon here, um, or something like that. So here we get it depending only on the degree of the graph, as in the the number of neighbors of the given vertex. Okay, so just writing just writing strictly less than one would be a bit meaningless for a finite graph. You need something more quantitative for it to make sense, for it to be for it to have any content. Um, and we bounded away from one by 
and have epsilon with epsilon depending only on um, the number on the degree or the valency, maybe I'll call it valency to avoid confusion with the growth, growth degree on the valency of G, i.e. Um, the number of um, neighbors a given vertex has. And let me tell you what I mean by one dimensional. Um, so before I, before I define it, let me tell you that dimensions is a slightly subtler, um, uh, a slightly subtler notion in, in um, finite graphs than infinite graphs. So for example, our theorem does apply to a torus, which is n by log n. So it does apply to an n by log n torus and does not apply to a kind of an n by root log n. Okay, so somehow in um, in the infinite case, we have this well-defined infinite dimension that I mentioned about in terms of the growth rate. In the finite case, uh, it's a bit more subtle because you know where where does an n by m? If you if you look at an n by m torus and you let m vary from one to n, at what point does does it change from being one-dimensional to two-dimensional? Well, for the purposes of this, it's around about um, n by log n. Okay. Um, so let me define it more um, precisely. Um, okay, so the diameter of G is the maximum distance between any two um, vertices. And we basically, our theorem applies if the diameter of G is less than the number of vertices divided by log v to the power of c, some constant c. Okay, and here c is an absolute constant. Um, and if you're, those of you who are astute may have noticed that this at first sight doesn't necessarily apply to this graph that I've done here, but I want to say that if um, if um, G is an, uh, a Cayley graph of an abelian group, then you can indeed take C plus one. All right. Um, so maybe to compare this um, a little bit to the infinite case to, to motivate this definition a bit more. Um, if, if we write um, uh, gamma for the diameter of G, then the number of um, vertices equals, um, well then the, the set of vertices is exactly the ball of radius diameter about any vertex. Okay, so um, this is somehow um, similar to saying that um, the ball of radius diameter is at most um, um, is at most gamma times log gamma. Um, Okay, so this diameter condition is actually of a similar um, shape to the um, to the to the condition on an infinite graph that determines its growth rate. 
if you if you look at the the size of the ball of um, uh, of radius the diameter um, then um, I guess we want that there sorry um, then this diameter condition here is somehow the same as saying that that ball is has size slightly larger than um, linear in its radius okay so that's how that condition relates to um, the growth rate definition of dimension in the infinite case is that clear to everyone any any questions at this point no. anyway i don't want to get too bogged down in the exact notion because this i'm, I'm not going to what i what i discuss in this um talk is not going to depend too heavily on the exact notion of dimension that we take anyway but i think to give you a precise statement it's good to um, but but i mean it's not it's not just an artifact of the proof it's that that's the right map yes uh yes so i i think for example i think you can't I, do I, better but no right i think well well so um this 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 c uh so so as i'm i'm about to tell you that this this was um something like this was conjectured by um itai benjamini and he conjectured that the c should be one so you definitely can't do better in um the case of abelian groups because i think this this the P pc does go to one as n goes to infinity for this graph um but so the one the one area where we where this this result may not be optimal is 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 yeah the value of this c for an arbitrary um an arbitrary um, vertex transit graph, um, but yeah, if you made that, if we could, if we could prove it with that c equal to one, then that that would definitely be best possible. Right. Um, yeah. So let me let me write that as well. That um, Benjamin Benjamini, I think in two thousand and one, conjectured. Um, that this was true with c equals one. So, by the way, I'll, I'll, I think I'll mention this c. We this in theory, in principle, this is completely explicit. Um, uh, we don't we don't bother to compute it explicitly, um, but it's certainly at most. I think the way we've written the argument is at most five hundred, and I I believe that if we were really careful and optimized everywhere and worked everything out, we should be able to get it down to something like 20 or less. Um, but we definitely don't. There are a couple of places in the argument where we lose um, log factors. So we definitely don't get one, um, except in the obedient case. But it's equally, it's not, it's not some kind of massive ineffective constant either. Um, right. So I want to um, first of all give you a rough idea of um, the overall. Again, like I did with the DGRSY result, I want to tell you roughly overall how this, um, how the proof of this goes. It goes along a similar structure, and then I want to give you some idea of um, how it differs and some of the additional difficulties we face in the finite case and how and how we overcome them. Okay, so again, a high level sketch is um so first of all we basically adapt ggrsy to show that if um uh g is at least 12 dimensional and i won't tell you exactly what i mean by 12 dimensional but it's defined in a in a similar way to um similar way to this um then um then pc is less than one so just like they did we use we basically use their methods um to show that in the high dimensional case you can just um you can just do it so that's fine and then in the infinite setting they used these theorems of gromov and trofimov to reduce to the case of a nilpotent um Cayley graph um here we use a much more recent finite tree version of that Gromov Trofimov theory. So here we use um, results 
of um, We are Green Tau, which is kind of um, instead of Gromov. And um, uh, Roman Tessera and, and me, which is instead of Trofimov. Well, we also do slightly, um, we have to refine the BGT stuff a little bit too, actually, Roman and I. But anyway, broadly speaking, it's results of these two um, to show that if the dimension is less than 12, then G is roughly isometric to a nilpotent Haley graph. Okay, and here, um, of course, in the finite case, everything has to be more quantitative. Um, so here, when I say roughly isometric, I mean with some control over the parameters. And again, for people who know what nilpotent groups are, um, there's some um, there's again some control over the complexity of this nilpotent group, which you don't need in the infinite case, but you do, but you need here and you get from these these two results. That that would be control over things like the class, the uh, yeah, I mean, the sort of weighted weighted. Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's exactly right. The class and in fact the rank, which in an early version of the argument we did need, although in the end we didn't need. But yeah. So the ver various you have various control on the the class is the main thing. Um, and I, I guess as well, yeah, no, I think, yeah, that's, I think that's, that's enough actually. Basically the class is the main thing you need. Um, and then things are a little bit trickier. So, um, I have, I have about 10 minutes. So I think what I'm going to do is just highlight some of the areas that are a bit trickier in the finite case and then give you an idea of how we overcome at least a couple of them. Okay. Um, so, so far it's you know, so much the same. Here are some, some difficulties with, with implementing um, this argument that arise here in the finite case. So firstly, in the infinite case, there really is, um, Oh, what did he conjecture? Oh, so, oh yeah, he, sorry, he conjectured that this, um, that after PC should be less than, so somebody asked in the chat, what did Benjamini conjecture? He conjectured that um, PC should be bounded away from one if um, you have this condition with C equal to one. So if the diameter is less than V over uh, log V. Okay, so he conjectured that our results should hold and you can prove that for abelian, but not for nilpotent in general, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. For nilpotent okay. in general, we we get C equal to the class. Ah, okay. And and then um, and so that yeah, so that's one of the reasons why I think if we were much more careful, we could probably because because Roman and I in more recent work get sharp control on the class, and I think with that sharp control, um, if we had had that before, we would have been a bit more motivated maybe to keep closer track of everything. And I, I, I suspect that we can get C. We definitely can't get it one, but I think we can get it quite low. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, the cl that cl that, there's another place where we lose, um, where we lose um, log factors as well. So it, it's, um, yeah. Um, right, so the first difficulty um, is that so in the infinite case, there's a there's a there's a there's a really a dichotomy between the high, the high dimensional and the low dimensional setting, All right? So either your graph is greater than twelve dimensional or it's at most twelve dimensional, and um, there's there's nothing else. Um, but in the in the finite case, you can your graph can in some sense have a different dimension on different scales. So I'm gonna I'm gonna draw an example. Which is actually an abelian case, so it it doesn't really fall, it doesn't cause any problems anyway. But it illustrates the point, I hope. Um, so if you have, um, say, you have, um, uh, let's say you have z mod m z um, to ten cross z mod um, 
m z squared, right, with m much, capital M much bigger than little m, okay, then when you look at, um, when you look at balls of radius less than little Wait, 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 you're using a standard generators for the Cayley graph? Nothing, uh, yes, yes. Nothing fancy there, okay. No, nothing fancy, standard generators, yeah. Um, and yeah, so with standard, standard, maybe I'll write that down, standard generators. And the point is when you look at balls of radius less than M, less than little m, this looks like a 12 dimensional graph. But then when you look at balls of radius much bigger than little m, but smaller than big M, then it looks like a, it looks like a two dimensional graph with a, with a kind of finite bit stuck on the end of it. Okay. And um, so in the, in the infinite case, if you had Z mod M Z, to the 10 cross z squared, then as radii tend to infinity, this finite bit just becomes negligible and this, this is uh, a two-dimensional graph. But in, the, in, this, in this finite case, it looks, looks 12-dimensional on low scales and looks two-dimensional on high scales. And um, for, for our finite tree um, analysis, we, we kind of need to un understand both situations. Okay, so unlike in the infinite case, this, this um, arg argument here um, doesn't quite yet capture um, what happens with graphs like this. Okay, so that's, that's one difficulty. And this is actually, I, I think, one of the hardest technical bits of the, um, of the proof is to, is, is, to, is to deal with this situation. Okay, I'm going to tell you about another difficulty. So I'm going to tell you about a couple more difficulties and then, um, then I'll, I'll talk about, I'll probably have five minutes to tell you at least how we deal with one of those difficulties. Okay. Um, another difficulty is in the, um, in the Nilkerton case. Um, you remember I, I mentioned earlier that the way DGRSY use um, the Nilkerton C to um, get PC less than one in the low dimensional case is that they use the fact that um, a Nilkerton Cayley graph has a Z2 subgraph. And something a bit like that is true in the finite case. Um, but again, it's not quite um, it's not quite enough. So let me give you an example. So I, I still don't want to define Nilpotent groups because we don't have time, but let me just tell you that a sort of canonical example of a Nilpotent group is um, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write a Z sub, well maybe I'll write FP, then it's so if you look at um, Three by three upper triangular matrices over the field of uh, p elements um, with ones on the diagonal. Then that is a, that's a canonical example of a finite Nilpotent group, um, and that does and that's the, the and that is basically a. It's basically a th this finite group is basically three a three dimensional um, group. Except that it's four dimensional in terms well, of it, uh, it's four dimensional. The, inf the infinite one is four dimensional. That's true. Yes. Um, yeah, but in the finite, I mean, this, another, another, this, is, yeah. this is Heisenberg modulo P, right? That's, that's yeah, yeah, this. yeah, yeah. So if you replace FP by Z here, then it's four dimensional. Um, um, the finite, the finite groups behave slightly differently, but anyway, um, the point is, this does have a couple of two dimensional subgroups, which is this one. Uh, well, it has many, but here are two particular ones it has. Okay. And those are subgroups that are just, um, they're just isomorphic to um, ZP squared. And uh, in, the, in the infinite case, you can just say, aha, look, we've got this two-dimensional um, subgraph here. Um, so we apply um, the abelian um, classical theory to that, we apply Harris Kessman to that, and we know that if the probability is, is, is large enough, then this has an infinite subgraph. But you can't quite do that um, in, in this setting because all that would give you is a positive proportion of this um, subgraph being connected. But that is not, as, as this 
P, as this P, um, as in the size of the group goes to infinity, that is not a positive proportion of the whole group. Okay, so that's another issue that we face that doesn't arise in the infinite setting. Um, and then another issue is that um, when we started our work, there was not even a general theory for this, um, um, for this type of stuff in abelian candy graphs. Okay, so this, if you, could, if you could overcome this problem, then you have some hope of reducing to the abelian case. But unlike in, the, unlike in the infinite setting, the abelian finite case was also not fully understood when we started our work. So that's the remaining difficulty is that you still need to deal with the abelian case. Um, so I think I have, it looks to me like I have four minutes. So I um, will perhaps, I think the thing I've got most hope of being able to tell you in, in enough detail to convince you in that time is probably how you get around this issue of the, of the two dimensional subgraph in the Milton setting. So I'll, I'll just very quickly explain that. Um, basically, it turns out um, that to, to show that P, in the finite case, to show that PC is less than one, it's enough to show that, um, or it's equivalent, actually equivalent to showing that um, for all, for large enough P, um, probability that um, X and Y are connected in GP is bigger than one minus epsilon for all X, Y, and G. Okay, so in the in the infinite, um, in the sorry, in the finite case, showing that there's a, a high probability of having a large connected component is equivalent to showing that there's a high probability that any two arbitrary vertices are connected. That's in the infinite in the finite. That's for a transitive graph. Okay. Uh, and I, th I think that's due to SRAM originally. Um, and so what we do is um, you can, let me just, I'm just gonna draw this, um, this three dimensional graph like a, like a, a box. Okay. And in the, um, in the infinite case, when you have a, a higher dimensional graph and you want to um, you want to show that PC is less than one, you just look at some two dimensional subgraph like this, and you show that that has a large um, connected component. So what we do is using this equivalent um, version of PC, we show that if you start with two arbitrary vertices of your three dimensional graph, what you do is you first of all look at um, uh, one two-dimensional subgraph that contains the first vertex, then you find another two-dimensional subgraph that contains the second vertex and intersects the, um, the first two-dimensional subgraph, and then you pick some additional vertex that lies in the intersection of these. And then, if you can prove the abelian um, case, what you have is you, you find then a high probability of this vertex being connected to that one and a high probability of this vertex being connected to that one. And then from that, you deduce the high probability of the two vertices being connected. Okay, so um, that's, that's how you deal with that. And it, in general, so I, in, this, in this specific example, I, I wrote out, it's not hard to find um, these two subgraphs. You just take the appropriate cosets of these two subgroups um, in an arbitrary Nilpotent group, finite Nilpotent group, it's, it's less clear that these two two-dimensional subgroups exist, but by a, a fairly careful study of the geometry of Nilpotent groups, we show that um, something like this works for an arbitrary finite Nilpotent group. Um, okay, and that's 11 o'clock, I think, so I should stop. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Matt. Questions? Thanks. Any questions? No questions?
Hi, so, I, I have a, a question. Um, so you consider the pieces more than one. I'm not sure if that, uh, that's trivial with pieces, that or piece, I don't know. As a, whether or not considering each piece strictly greater than zero. Uh, sorry, I didn't. Oh, it's about PC being strictly greater than zero. Uh, yeah. Is that a question? Yeah. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, there may well be people in the audience who know the answer to that better than it's I just uh, in bounded degree, PC is always greater than zero. Yeah, because otherwise it's just bounded by a subcritical branching process. Just bigger than one over the degree. Thanks. Um, any more questions? Um, I have a question. Uh, your your bound depends uh, only on the valence in the degree of the graph. Uh, yeah. Can you also uh, show that if this degree happens to be extremely high? then your bound uh, improves and then uh, then you can bound it away i don't know from one half even less than one half yeah it, it's a very good question um we would we would definitely like to ah so yeah we would definitely like to um get rid of this dependency on the valency and doing something like that is would would is it sounds like a very sensible way of doing it um mm -hmm. i think there has quite recently been some so um one um it turns out that because uh, because we have to make our analysis quite um, quantitative, it turns out that we do also get some more quantitative information in the infinite case. So we prove um, that there's a there's a gap for PC at one for infinite transitive graphs. Okay, but again, depending on the valency. So mm -hmm. if you have um, if you have an infinite transitive graph of bounded valency then there's some absolute epsilon such that either PC is one or PC is at most um, one minus epsilon. So there are some recent work um, which improves that and does make the degree and does make get a bound independent of the valency in the infinite case, although I think only for Cayley graphs. Um, and I'm ashamed to say I can't now remember who it's by. Probably Ariel will know maybe. Uh, I think it's one of Frank of Flevero and uh, and uh, I forgot who else. Yeah, um, it's the uh, false. Sorry, Itainos. Ah, yeah. Christ Christophos. I, I just don't know him. Ah, sorry, I, I'm confused. Are you saying that the statement that you made your main theorem about PC smaller than one uniformly does not hold for graph sequences that are transitive but have a degree going to infinity? Um, uh, yeah, yes, well, we don't know. Yeah, we don't, we, we've not, we've proved it under, under a, a bounded degree, unbounded valency assumption. It sounds like it should be easier on that. Yeah, I, I agree. We, we agree. <laughs> um, and to be honest, we haven't thought about it in any, in any detail yet. So it is something we talked about working on and we have, we just haven't had a chance to think about it, but I, I agree. It, it sounds so where it breaks down is all the, the finite group theory business that uh, is not uh, developed for these kind of uh, Cayley graphs. Yeah, we, well, we use it in a few places. So in, in the abelian, in our brilliant abelian proof, we induct on the number of generators. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, we also use it in, in adapting the DGRSY stuff as well. There are a few places where, I mean, you, 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 I think to go through our argument and get rid of it, you'd need so many, you'd need to, there are so many places you need to get rid of but it. Can you, can you properly define dimension bigger than one when the degree is not bounded? Um, I think you could, I suspect what you would need to do is, let me just turn back to my, Camera. Um, so actually, so this this um, this 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 BGT and Tessera and me stuff does um, so that stuff does actually account for the degree and and you basically we we prove um, if the ball of radius r is at most um, um, the valency times um, r to the d. So our, our 
um, in these results, the, the actual um, kind of dimension no than D condition looks something like this and does, and does um, factor it in. So in the other, the other work I was gonna, I hoped to tell you about originally was, was some similar stuff, but, but um, looking at random walks on, and, and transits of random walks on finite graphs, whatever that uh, appropriately defined. And, and, and in that work, we are able to make everything independent of the degree using the fact that this um, BGT and TT stuff is kind of factors in the degree with, with this condition. But the problem is with this percolation work, we use the degree kind of appears in, in, in various other places as well as, you know, not just in the definition of dimension, but we use it in various other places as well. Uh, and one more thing is, is it correct to say that BGT is a uh, Cayley graph and TT is the transformation to uh, transitive graph? Yeah. So again, if I, yeah, if I had more time, I would have given you a more precise breakdown of who's responsible for what, but loosely that's, that's basically what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, TT, we also have to, we have to, so basically one, one, one thing that BGT gets is that under this condition in a Cayley graph, they they show that then the 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 um the asymptotic growth rate um of so growth degree of um g is at most um some function of d so having having this bound a degree d bound at one scale doesn't give you a degree d bound at all scales it gives you a but it gives you some control and what um, what TT do is is optimize this, and that's important for some aspects of the work as well. Um, and then, but 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 basically, yeah, BGT is the Cayley graph stuff, and TT is 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 um, showing the transitive graphs um, are quantitative quantitatively rough isometric to Cayley graphs. But in the part of your work where you assume that the dimension uh, is is smaller than twelve. Yes. If, if I had told you, you know, if you had to prove the same statement under dimension smaller than 100, would that just work uh, flawlessly or? Yeah, that... it would, it would change. The only thing it would change is, is, is the value of that C. Uh, uh -huh. I think it wouldn't, uh, that's because, and that's because you would, um, you would have to work with a nil percent C, a higher nil percent C class. Mm -hmm. So we induct, we induct on the nil percent C class when we deal with nil percent groups and, um, uh, so, but that's the only difference it would make. The, arg the, the argument, the, the structure of the argument would be identical. So why is it important to get these uh, 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 sharp bounds on this f of d that uh, um, you mentioned? Because as long as you yeah, know Yeah, so I agree. Yes, yeah, you're right, actually. I think you're right, probably. So that this is very important for the random walk stuff. I see, I see. The stuff yeah, I just told you about is not so important. Okay. I agree. I agree. Okay. But it's crucial for the random walk stuff. Any more questions? Okay, so if not, let's thank Matt again. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks very much for having me. Yeah, and uh, I'll see everybody in two weeks, I guess.